third application is to a specific kind of problem called a mixing problem. And these might seem kind of contrived here at the beginning, but the point is that mixing problems are a good stand-in for all sorts of applications where you have something being mixed together, whether it's a physical mixing or some other form that looks similar to this. So this is a class of problems that is very valuable for different kinds of applications. So I've got two examples here, and by looking at these two examples, we'll get a sense of kind of all of the different complications you might run into if you see one of these problems. On the left hand side, we have a tank that holds 500 liters of a mixture, and the mixture is going to be water with salt mixed in. Of course, the mixture could be any two substances, but we'll use water with salt mixed throughout, sometimes called brine. So initially this tank holds pure water and then a valve is opened and into this tank pours five liters per minute of a mixture of salt and water. So initially it's pure water and then salt water pours in and it mixes throughout and then an outlet also carries five liters per minute out. And we're going to assume that it's thoroughly mixed at all times. We won't deal with anything more complicated than that. So five liters enters every minute, five liters exits every minute, and as time goes on, this water in the tank gets saltier and saltier, and it approaches the level of salt that's in this inlet flow. So the inlet flow, every liter of water carries with it 0.2 kilograms of salt. That's the mixture of salt and water that's coming in. A liter of water with 0.2 kilograms of salt mixed in with it. So in the long term, if we left this mixing for a long time, eventually every liter of water in this tank would carry with it 0.2 kilograms of salt. So we would end up with 100 kilograms of salt mixed into this 500 liter tank. But our goal is going to be to find a function y that describes the amount of salt in the tank at any point in time. So y of t is changing and it's increasing from zero approaching that most salty uh, level. But notice what happens here. As this mixture comes in and as a mixture goes out, the level in the tank stays constant. There's always going to be 500 liters of mixture in there because every minute 5 liters comes in, 5 liters goes out, it's balanced, and so the level in the tank will stay steady. Compare that to the other side. In part B, we have two inlets coming in. That doesn't really complicate things much other than that the saltiness level of the two is slightly different, but it turns out that isn't really too much of a problem. But notice how 25 liters total comes in every minute and 20 liters goes out. So every minute, five liters gets added to the tank. So after one minute, the tank will hold 505 liters, then 510 the next minute, and so on. So the level in the tank is rising in this example. Also notice how initially there's some salt mixed into the tank and that's going to affect things as well. But the big difference between the two is that on the left, the level stays consistent. On the right, the level of mixture in the tank changes, it actually rises. And I point that out because as we'll find, that difference means that we have to use a different method of solution for each of them. It turns out that the one on the left is going to be a separable equation and the one on the right will not. And we'll have to solve that one using an integrating factor according to the first order linear approach that we saw earlier. So I'm going to set up the differential equation and the setup looks very similar for both of them. But then when we go to solve them, we'll find that we'll need to use different methods for both. The key to both of these problems, and to any mixing problem, is that if we're looking for the amount of salt in the tank, y, the rate of change of y 
is going to be the rate coming in minus the rate going out. In other words, we need to find how quickly salt enters the tank and how quickly salt leaves the tank. And if we find the difference between those two, we'll find the rate of change of salt. It's very simple when you state it that way, but it turns out that that simple concept is enough to build the differential equation that we need to. So dy dt is our rate of change. That will equal the rate in minus the rate out. So we'll work these two problems more or less in parallel just to see how they work side by side. And you can contrast the two to see where they differ. So on the left hand side, dy dt equals the rate in minus the rate out. Now think about the rate at which salt enters the tank. The rate of change of salt is going to be kilograms, which is what we're measuring salt in, per minute. It's a rate of change over time. So we're looking for kilograms of salt per minute. All you have to ask yourself is, each minute, how many kilograms of salt enter the tank? If 0.2 kilograms enter with every liter of water that comes in, and five liters of water are coming in every minute, we can just multiply those two to find how many kilograms of salt come in. Five liters of water come in, each one of them carries 0.2 kilograms of salt for a total of one kilogram of salt per minute. In other words, we would write five liters per minute times 0.2 kilograms per liter. Notice how the units cancel and we would get one kilogram per minute coming in. Then for the rate out, we're going to think about it the same way, but it'll take a little bit more thought to figure out. The rate coming in was the concentration of salt, 0.2 kilograms per liter, times the flow rate, 5 liters per minute. The rate out is going to be the same thing. It's going to be the concentration of salt in the tank, how much salt there is per liter of water times five liters per minute. So it'll still be five liters per minute times the number of kilograms per liter in that tank. Now here's the key. The amount of salt in the tank is changing and we don't specifically know what it is at any given point in time, but we do know that whatever it is, we're calling it Y. So the amount of salt in the tank total is Y, and then the amount of water in the tank is always going to be 500. So each liter of water in that tank will hold Y divided by 500 kilograms of salt. In other words, if we take the total amount of salt in the tank at any point in time and divide that by the total volume in the tank, that gives us the concentration. So that means that's going to be Y over 100 kilograms per minute. So that's probably the hardest part to understand as you're starting these problems, getting that concept of how we build this differential equation. But if you remember rate in minus rate out, and each rate is simply the concentration of salt times the flow rate. The flow rates are just given, the concentration of salt coming in is just given, and the concentration of salt going out is always going to be the amount of salt in the tank divided by the amount of water in the tank. Now let's jump ahead and think about the problem on the right, problem B. In that case, we're going to again picture the rate coming in and the rate going out, and dy dt will be the difference between these two. So let me jump ahead before we go on to solve part A and let's write down the similar equation for part B. Again, we'll have rate in minus rate out. Now notice that we have two inlets. That just means we're gonna add the amount of salt coming in for each inlet together. So for the top one, we have 0.2 kilograms per liter, five liters per minute. If we multiply those together, one kilogram of salt enters every minute through that inlet. And then the second one has 0.1 kilograms per liter, 20 liters per minute. 
So that's a total of two kilograms per minute. If we add those together, we get a total of three kilograms of salt coming in every minute. So we can go down and write that down. Each inlet, we take the concentration times the flow rate. So we get a total of three kilograms of salt per minute coming in. That's the rate in. For the rate out, let's look again carefully at this problem. Again, we're going to take the amount of salt in the tank, divide it by the amount of mixture in the tank, and then multiply that concentration by 20 liters per minute. So we're gonna do the same thing we did on the first problem. We're gonna multiply 20 liters per minute by Y divided by the amount of mixture in the tank. So let me start there. The problem is figuring out how much mixture there is at any point in time. Notice that initially there are 500 liters of mixture, but as we mentioned, 25 liters comes in, 20 liters goes out every minute. So that mixture rises by five liters every minute. Think about what that's gonna do. It's gonna start at 500 and every minute it'll add five. So the total volume will be 500 plus five times however many minutes have gone by. So 500 plus five T. That's the complication on this second example. And that's enough to make this problem significantly more complicated. Now it turns out we can simplify a little bit and write that as 4y over 100 plus t if you cancel a 5 from the numerator and denominator. So there's the differential equation for part b. It's slightly more complicated, but the principles are the same. We divide the amount of salt by the amount of mixture in the tank and multiply that by the flow rate to get the rate going out. And the rate coming in is just the same as it was last time. But it turns out that's enough to change this problem from being a separable one. Now we're gonna to have to use the first order linear approach using an integrating factor. So we've built the differential equation for each example. And the big difference is on the left, the flow rates are balanced so that mixture level stays the same the whole time. On the right, the mixture level is not consistent. It's rising. You could also envision a problem where, say, 20 liters per minute comes in, 25 liters goes out each minute, and so it would drop by 5 liters. In that case, it would be 500 minus 5t, and so on. The other piece of information we haven't used yet is the initial amount of salt. And you can already start thinking about how the initial condition is given in both cases. On the left side, we have an initial condition that it's pure water to begin with, which means the amount of salt to begin with is zero. There's no salt in the tank to begin with. On the right side, we're given the amount of salt initially is 50 kilograms. So that last piece of information is just the initial condition and the reason we haven't mentioned it yet is because that only comes up after we've solved the differential equation. That's when we'll use that information. So I'll point it out here, but we won't use it until we've solved each differential equation. Now to solve each of these, we need to think back to our methods of solution. Both of these are first order equations. The first one is a separable one. The second one is not. So we've got dy dt equals 1 minus y over 100. Now if you notice, this actually fits the linear form as well. So this one is both separable and linear, which is kind of convenient. You can solve it whichever way you choose. But I'll solve it here by separation, and then I'll solve the other one using a linear approach. So to show that this is separable, we need to do a little bit of algebra to write it in a separable form. We could just divide one minus y over 100 on both sides of the equation, 
because there's no t on the right side. But to make the algebra a little bit simpler, let me rearrange things a bit, and I'll write this as dy dt equals 100 minus y over 100. In other words, I'll get that as one fraction on the right side. Entirely an optional step, but it helps make the rest of the problem slightly simpler to work out. Then we can divide both sides by 100 minus y and multiply dt on both sides. Then we can integrate. I will leave it to you to show that the left hand side becomes the negative, the natural log of 100 minus y. The right hand side of course becomes t over 100 plus c. And again, I'll leave it to you to solve this and show that y equals 100 minus k e to the negative t over 100. And then based on the fact that we start with pure water, our initial condition therefore being y of 0 equals 0, we can show also that k equals 100 for this specific example. So I'm leaving some steps out for you to solve. You can go through and verify each of those things, but with a little bit of effort, you should be able to verify this integral, solve using a little bit of algebra, and then plug in the initial condition to get the full form of the solution, the specific solution to this one. So it's relatively easy, it's separable, doesn't take a lot of work. The setup is the hard part, but if you can follow the setup and you can do it on your own, if you run across one of these problems, the only thing that will change is the numbers. The general setup will be very similar to this one. And so if everything's balanced, the inlet and outlet flows are balanced, it will be separable just like this one. And you might have different numbers to work with, but the process and the approach will be just like this. On the other hand, in this second example, again, the setup is the hard part. But in this case, because of that 100 plus T, on the right side, this one is not separable. We need to use the first order linear approach. So I'll write this as, again, dy dt equals three minus four y over 100 plus t. But notice how I separated the y off, and then I'll add that to both sides. So I'll write this as y prime instead of dy dt plus four over 100 plus t times y equals three. The entire purpose for doing that is so that it's now written in the standard first order linear form. Where we can pick out, here's P of T, and here's Q of T, just like we had P of X and Q of X before, now T is our independent variable. So we have P of T and Q of T. Remember with first order linear ones, the first Part of the problem is to find your integrating factor. So in this case, i will be a function of t. That's e to the integral of p. So e to the integral of four over 100 plus t. That looks more complicated than it really is because when you integrate four over 100 plus t, you get four times the natural log of 100 plus t. And now to simplify, we really want to have e to the ln of something. So we need to use that power rule for logs that we talked about earlier and move this to the power. So this becomes e to the ln of 100 plus t to the fourth. The e and the ln cancel. So you simply get 100 plus t to the fourth. That's your integrating factor. So when you multiply that through the entire equation, the left hand side will simply equal the derivative of that times y and the right hand side will equal three times that. Now we simply integrate both sides and I will leave it to you to show that what you get is three fifths times 100 plus t to the fifth and then plus c, of course. Then when you divide by 100 plus t to the fourth, you get y equals 3 fifths 
times 100 plus t plus c times 100 plus t to the negative 4. And then you can solve for c using the initial condition, knowing that y of 0 equals 50. You can figure out that c equals this rather large number. And I will again leave it to you to work out the details there. But solving it is relatively straightforward, even though the numbers make things look more complicated than they are because we're working with rather large numbers here. But in principle, it's just like any of the first order linear equations that we've already been solving before. And once again, the hard part with this mixture problem is always the setup. But now you've seen these two examples and every other mixing problem that you'll see will fit into the pattern of one of these two. So as long as you can set up these two and solve these two, there's nothing that will surprise you in a mixing problem.